Hi, everybody. We're just getting our videos up and running, and we'll start in just one minute. People are still loading in. Great, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on the second conversation about raising resilient girls. I'm Danielle Portnoy with the Girl Scouts of Greater Los Angeles, and we're so excited to be with you today. During our last panel discussion, we addressed feelings of isolation and COVID fatigue. Today, we really look forward to diving into managing stress, anxiety, and depression. Being girl-led is part of Girl Scouts DNA which is why this year, last year, Girl Scouts Research Institute conducted a national survey to learn about the mental health issues that girls care the most about and understand how they want to be supported. The results of the study weren't surprising, but they are alarming. Girls are deeply concerned about the stress, anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues that they and their parent, uh, peers are experiencing. And they're asking adults to take notice. So let's start off by hearing from a few girls here in Los Angeles who have shared their story and feelings about how this past year has impacted their life. Well, one of the most difficult parts of the pandemic was school for me. I had a pretty hard time transitioning from in-person to online and I felt that I was a lot more stressed with work, especially since I had to transition from middle school to high school. Well, when it first happened, um, for a few days we didn't even have school, and then all of a sudden school just was online. And now I'm doing virtual school, which is a little bit better because you're actually in Google Meets, but it's just strange because school went from just being there to being on a computer. It's been pretty hard to adjust to this new format of school and this new format of learning. I have been struggling to adjust with it even now, and the it was just a big shock and a big change for me that I'm still kind of adjusting to. The most difficult aspect was probably staying motivated. It was quite hard just to stay motivated while practically not having anything to do for quite a while. The pandemic changed a lot about how I lived. The first main thing that I think everyone had to really go through was the transition to staying home every day which was quite sudden in my opinion, and I had a bit of trouble adjusting. And it's been hard to stay um, with masks on because they're so different. And I've had to stay away from a lot of my friends and just had to connect with them online. Zoom takes a lot out of me. It makes me pretty tired after every session. And so it's been pretty hard to like do Zoom for hours a day. I was always used to having my schedule packed, or something always to do, like practices for robotics or practices for Science Olympiad. One big aspect of my life that was also affected was my plans for the summer and the year. I had some planned trips for Girl Scouts, which got cancelled. For example, my troop's bridging ceremony and a trip to Savannah with some of my fellow sisters, which really bummed me out. The parties that um, my family would have, which was only like once a year, which was pretty amazing for me. I didn't get to do that this year, or last year, but it was still nice to see them on a Zoom call. <laughs> it's really hard to not be able to connect with them in person and really be able to see their expressions when you're talking. It's kind of hard to know what someone really means in text or email sometimes. Yeah, I really felt those girls' sadness in and stress in my heart. Um, and this is why we're here today. I'm really honored to introduce our moderator for today, Kyle Kittleson with MedCircle. MedCircle is a very generous platinum sponsor for this event, and we're so grateful for their participation. Kyle will be guiding us through this conversation with our esteemed panelists. Welcome, Kyle, and thanks for joining us again. Kyle, we can't hear you.
Can you hear me now? Yes. Less ideal, but uh, hopefully you can still hear me. Um, well, we'll get right into it. We have some great doctors today. Uh, for those watching live in the chat, I would love for you to put one thing that you would like to learn from today's discussion. All of the doctors, even when they're not speaking, uh, will be reading the comments and uh, participating in some of those group chats. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Now let's go to uh, our first doctor, Dr. Judy Ho, one of my favorite people who joined us in our first panel. Dr. Judy, as a Girl Scouts of Greater Los Angeles board member and as a licensed and triple board certified clinical neuropsychologist, what are the rates that you're seeing uh, of anxiety and depression among this young demographic of uh, girls? Great question, Kyle, and it's always great to work with you. We definitely see that anxiety and depression are on the rise, and there are a number of different types of studies that have been looking at, especially how the pandemic has even increased the prevalence that we see. And what we know is that about one in three adolescents between the ages of 13 to 18 will experience an anxiety disorder that is diagnosable at some time. And that rate is higher among teenage girls. And what's more concerning is that among teenage girls, we also see that there's a higher rate of suicidal ideation and hopelessness. And all of these things, of course, can lead to really deleterious outcomes. And sometimes when teens are suffering these kinds of symptoms, they don't talk about it openly with parents and teachers. Um, oftentimes they will socially isolate and there's a great degree of shame and also a lot of confusion about what's happening. And so sometimes they don't talk about it, which of course is why it's so important for us to talk about the warning signs and how we can help our girls. It is also important to note that these numbers, this one in three statistic that I just cited, it has been riding steadily already before the pandemic. So that other studies have seen that it's more like 40% or 45%. And depression is also on a similar curve. We see that children and teenagers, there's about a one in four chance that they will develop a clinically diagnosable depression at some point, And mm -hmm. that that rate again is a little higher in our girls. I'd like to get a feel for the viewers who are watching this live. We're going to have a poll pop up on your screen right now about the age range of the children that uh, you either care for directly or are here to support. Uh, are those children ages 0 to 5, 6 to 10, 11 to 14, or 15 to 18? While you put in those questions, or those answers rather, I would like to uh, take it to Dr. Amy West. Dr. West was in our first panel. Dr. West, wonderful to have you back with us today. So happy to be back. Now you uh, are very involved working with children and you work at the Children's Hospital. How can a parent or caregiver help empower, empower their girl to feel confident to ask for help? Really great question. Yes, absolutely. And I so didn't important. write that question. That sounded like I came up with that question. <laughs> that was not my question. That is a great question from somebody. No qualification else. needed, Kyle. <laughs> so, it is a fabulous question, no matter who asks it. Um, yeah, you know, I think it, first and foremost, we really want to teach our, our kids, but our girls in particular, that it is strength to be vulnerable. So there is power and there is strength and vulnerability. I feel like that's a lesson that our society often tries to kind of unteach us. And it's really important for kids to understand that we are all vulnerable beings. And a lot of our power comes from being able to be vulnerable and to ask for help. So the first thing we want to do is tell our kids that, uh, communicate them to them that, you know, it's okay to to struggle. It's okay to be challenged by life. That's the human condition. It's okay to ask for help. Um, so I think we can tell that to them very directly, you know, narrate that through, through our daily lives, through interactions with them. Um, equally as important probably is to model that. So, you know, as adults, we, you know, fall prey to that these same misconceptions that, you know, vulnerability is weakness and we need to kind of hide the fact that we need help and that we can't cope with everyday life. And so I think the most powerful message we can send to our kids is to model for them asking for help. Um, so let them see us struggle. Tell them that we're struggling. 
let them watch us ask for help, ask our partners for help, ask our parents for help, ask our friends for help, ask our colleagues for help. Um, and you know, if they don't have the opportunity to always see us in action doing that, tell them um, that that you know. I think to say, you know what, mommy had a really rough day today, and I had to ask for help. You know, I, I was really struggling to get through the day. I had to ask one of my colleagues to take over leading a meeting because I needed to take a walk. You know, I was really. Um, not doing well. And then the last thing I would say is to um, create space for those conversations to happen. So, you know, one of the things that happens when we all get so stressed and it's pandemic living and everything's uncertain and all our routines have changed is that sometimes we're not creating um, space for us to have those conversations with our kids. So one of the things that I do, I have a five-year-old um, and, and every night um, as we lie in bed after we read our stories, we, and he often will bring this up himself. It's not even me that initiates this conversation, but we always ask each other, what was the hardest part of your day? What was the best part of your day? And it just provides us both an opportunity to, so again, I can model and he can express to talk about, yeah, what went well during the day and what didn't go well. And I think just opening, you know, um, experience up for that, that dialogue creates space for, you know, him um, to, to express you know, when things don't go well and when, what he might need help with. Really well, well said. In the chat, a lot of people are saying, well, my, my daughter is, I can tell, suffering from depression and anxiety. She is, in many ways, asking for help. She is being vulnerable. So when they come to us in this very fragile state and the solution is likely not something that's going to take effect right away, it could be weeks or months, or it may require developing a new set of skills to exist in this world. How do you start to have that conversation with a young, young girl? Well, you know, I think, um, first of all, just validating those feelings and, and, and that emotion is, is probably what they need in that moment. I mean, you're right, like we can't fix everything, particularly, uh, you know, anxiety, depression, um, you know, they're very pernicious, we can't fix them right away. And so, but I think, you know, in those moments, what kids need are, you know, it's just a little bit of validation to be heard, to be seen in their struggle, mm -hmm. and to know that there's hope, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think just um, saying that, you know, this is tough, like we're going through a really tough time, and it's not going to get better overnight. And it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to not feel well and, and you know, um, it's okay if that lasts a while and if it doesn't get better tomorrow, we're just gonna take one step forward at a time. We're gonna take one day at a time. And as long as we're moving in the right direction and, you know, towards feeling better, that's what matters. Um, so, so I think maybe giving, yeah, giving them space to know that it's not supposed to get better overnight. Not yeah, so wonderful. Really Let's go to the results of that poll. We'll see uh, if there's one age group that pops up as the majority here. Maybe that can frame some of our conversations. It looks like most people have a uh, child or are working with children over the age of six, the majority between 11 to 14. Oh, those peak teenage years. Uh, we are going to uh, go to our next amazing guest, Dr. Meza. Her and I got to speak before this. She is wonderful. She's from UCLA Symbols Institute's Youth Stress and Mood Program. Dr. Meza, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me for this important conversation. Yes, and I love your background. So we understand that parents just want to protect their children, and sometimes they struggle with knowing how much or how little they should worry, get involved. I know these people. What are some parenting behaviors that might be linked with youth anxiety and depression? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, most of the literature has pointed to saying that a parent's own anxiety and depression is linked to their teenager's anxiety and depression, but there's one particular behavior that is a really strong indicator, and that's parenting stress. And the reason why parenting stress is linked to their teens' anxiety and depression is because it leads to more ineffective parenting. Uh, so what do I mean by ineffective parenting? They might be more inconsistent in their disciplining style. They might be less warm. So it really gets in the way of them to, to be able the most effective parents that they can be. Um, so managing 
parenting stress is one of the most effective skills um, to help your teen with their anxiety and depression. And, and some uh, strategies that really help manage parenting stress are things like mindfulness, you know, stopping to smell the roses, uh, being present in your everyday activities, um, and really catching unhelpful thoughts that you may have about your own parenting. Um, and really checking the facts to see if they're true. This really goes back to that principle that we all know, but it, it, we often need a reminder is that you got to take care of yourself first. Yes. You know, I bet all of these parents or caregivers who signed up for this class today go, well, I'm going to do this because I'm a parent and I'm going to learn about my daughter. And I'm going to help my daughter and my daughter, and my daughter, and my daughter. Well, hey, yes. newsflash, it's all about you today. So <laughs> welcome to your life. Absolutely. Now, but what about the stress and anxiety that naturally comes when you learn, oh my gosh, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling anxious. I now am feeling depressed and anxious because I might be affecting my child from feeling depressed and anxious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's really those thoughts that could be really, we call them sticky thoughts. You know, um, a parent thinking, uh, I'm not doing a good job. I'm not, you know, managing my own anxiety and depression. And now I'm really messing up my kid and I'm not going to be able to help them. So really stopping, being able to stop those thoughts, acknowledge them, right? Because they're mm -hmm. giving you information that something is going on yeah. that you you need to to also take care of yourself like you were saying you can't pour from an empty cup so how can you fill your your cup as a parent so that you can be more effective in helping your teen wonderful don't forget about yourself parents there's another poll i'm going to throw up for our live viewers which of the following do you think contributes most to mental or emotional health issues in children your options are stress, bullying, pressure from parents, pressures from teachers or coaches, alienation, competition with peers, or social media. While you fill in those answers, Dr. Judy, you uh, see a lot of different types of people. And among young girls, the age demographics can often inform how symptoms of anxiety and depression present. How may anxiety and depression look different in a young girl, maybe let's say in the age of six and seven, as opposed to a young girl in her teens? Well, what we see with younger populations is that anxiety and stress will often manifest in separation anxiety. So not wanting to be away from the home or from parental or caregivers. It also might manifest in more bodily based complaints. And so what we sometimes see with these younger children is that they'll complain that they have a stomach ache or that they have a headache and they don't feel well. And that's actually a code for possible emotional distress as well. So it's really important as parents to really ask, you know, where, is, where are these symptoms coming from? How are you feeling? And again, just having that open dialogue about feelings and emotions. And as Dr. Amy West mentioned, you know, just being able to model that as an adult, that we can talk about this openly. And sometimes mommy and daddy, we don't feel great either, you know, but some, and sometimes when we don't feel great, our stomach also hurts, you know, just being able to really validate their experience and make it more normative. When we get into preteens and teenagers, sometimes what we'll see is that if they do have the emotional vocabulary, they will talk about it a, a bit more and they might actually even use words like stress and anxiety, but that's not all teens. And so sometimes what we'll see is that they actually might start acting out in different ways. They might not get along with their peers. Um, they might be slipping in their schoolwork. Um, they may seem more withdrawn at school and at home. They come home and they immediately go to their room and don't come out. And when you ask them to come out for dinner or any kind of family events or dragging their feet, they do the minimum, they go right back to their room. So that social isolation can be really strong as they get older. And oftentimes we may even see, and we're talking about some of these more severe forms of anxiety, stress, and depression that might even lead teens to contemplate self-harm and suicide, what we'll see is that they may start to talk about giving away their possessions, things that are really important to them, saying things that sound like vague threats, like, well, maybe this will be the last time you see me or the last time you have to deal with me. And we really have to pay attention to those. I know that as a parent, that can feel so scary and frustrating, but it's really important to 
ask them questions. Again, keep that open line. Um, they don't want your parental monitoring, but you must do it. You must be on top of them, not in such a um, not in such a derogatory way and not in such a pushy way, but you do have to ask them where they are, who they're hanging out with, what they're doing, keep tabs on their social media, keep tabs on what they're doing on their laptops and phones. I've advised parents that they really need to let their teens know that having these personal devices is a privilege. And if they want them, then parents always have to have the password so that they can really see what's going on. Because sometimes we'll even see that teenagers are sharing these ideas and thoughts that they're having on social media or in these blogs and parents don't know about it until a lot later that their kid has been struggling so much with anxiety and depression maybe for months or even years it is so important to note and if any of the doctors disagree with this please tell me because i'm not the doctor but I, I speak to a lot of them that when it is acceptable and okay to ask your child are you thinking have you thought about hurting yourself have you thought about uh, committing, you know, killing yourself, you can, it's hard to ask that. It was hard just me now to say that out loud, right? But it is the question that could be the life-saving question that you ask. And so um, if you've never asked it out loud, I always recommend people practice because the practice in private makes the public uh, performance a little more um, uh, impactful, I think. Let's have the uh, results from that poll um, we will see where they think it goes. Looks like 61% say social media, no question, uh, is uh, contributing to mental health issues. Um, Dr. Judy, we'll start with you, but I'd love to hear from uh, the entire panel on this one. With social media, a lot of that, a lot of isolation co-occurs with social media use. We're, we're seeing a lot of parents say that my daughter is locking herself in her bedroom or she's spending a lot of time alone. And when I approach her, she goes, leave me alone. This is what I want. Is it okay to let your teenage daughter spend the entire weekend in her room, Dr. Judy? Uh, no, it's not, even <laughs> though I know that they're going to fight you on that, but no, okay. it isn't. Um, it, it's really hard, obviously, with uh, teenagers as they start to get a little bit more difficult to parent and they might be a little defiant. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. But that's why it's so important to try to set up some routines that always occur on different days of the week. And so on the weekends, it's really easy to say, okay, I want to let my child relax. This is their day to have fun. They finish their homework. You know, we'll just let them do whatever they like to do on the weekends, but it's actually really important to still structure your weekends. And so I think that, you know, at minimum, what I've advised parents is that there always should be a shared meal time. During the shared meal time, everybody has to be at the table and there's no devices. You literally put a box out at the entryway of wherever you're going to have dinner or lunch. And whenever you eat, everybody drops their devices in the box, including parents. And then after they're done eating, they can pick up their devices. That's one way to make sure that there's at least structure of some sort on the weekends where everyone is getting together. I also advise that it's really helpful to have family meetings that are occurring weekly. And these family meetings are not meant to be punitive. You can talk about fun things, but also you can talk about rules of the house or anything else that comes up, but that it's important to carve out that time. It can just be as short as 30 minutes where everybody in the family comes together and there should be a short agenda. You know, again, certain things that might be problems that need to be solved, but also even time dedicated to what are some fun things you guys would like to do over the next couple of weekends. Plan those out. That's just another opportunity for shared time with the family over the weekend. And have your kids be involved in the planning. Have them make suggestions. If they're really excited about an idea and your child is older, they're teenagers, have them plan the activity with you. And so I think that it's really important on the weekends to make sure there's a couple of places where you're touching base with your family, with your children. We have eyes on them where you can actually talk to them, have quality time where it's not interrupted by social media, their phones, the text and also your own distraction. So it's really right. important that parents commit to that as well and make sure that that time is protected and uninterrupted for family. Dr. Meza, on this same note, uh, what, what about the parents who say, yeah, no question my daughter is getting out of her room and I want her to be in a good mood again. Tell me how to do that. Yes, um, I absolutely agree with Dr. Judy Ho. Um, letting them stay in their room all weekend is only going to do one thing. It's going to 
continue to decrease their mood, they're going to stay depressed, and it's not going to help them. So one of my favorite strategies that um, I teach parent is a strategy called opposite action, and to teach this to their to their children, right? So what is the opposite of staying in your room? right? So that you can change that emotion. Mm. So staying in your room equals feeling really down and just not wanting to do anything. Well, what's the opposite? It could either be going to the park in a socially distanced way with friends, going to uh, Starbucks with mom, going on a walk with a dog, but really what is the opposite? And then doing a little experiment with your team. Ask them, how much do you think you're going to like doing this opposite activity? I bet you they're going to say, oh, I'm not going to like it at all. It's going to suck. And then have them do the activity. I guarantee you that after they do the activity, they're going to like, well, it didn't completely suck. Maybe right. it was okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good activity for us as well. Sometimes I don't want to go on my walk, but I do. And then I go, I'm glad I did that. Uh, Dr. Yeah. West, with, as somebody who works so closely with children, a lot of these kids, they're, they maybe never had anxiety or depression. And now the idea of going to high school for the first time after being in high school for a year and seeing everybody in person and being a part of a group is so overwhelming. What advice do you have for parents in order to support and prepare their child for this? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something that I think we're, we're seeing a, a lot now. And um, so, you know, I specialize in pediatric mood and anxiety disorders. And so in our clinic, you know, we're seeing a, a lot of kids coming in with um, anxiety around this transition back to school, you know, even kids who weren't school avoidant or school anxious before the pandemic. But I, I think that unfortunately, all of this isolation and fear and uncertainty in the past year has kind of been a breeding ground for social anxiety. And now kids feel like they have kind of lost or forgotten their, their social skills um, and kind of how to be around other kids. So again, I think, you know, the most important thing to do as parents is just to recognize and validate for kids that this is tough. This is a big transition. You know, mm -hmm. this has been a really weird and crazy and bizarre past year. Um, and, you know, in many ways, these new kind of routines have been created that are in stark contrast to kind of what their life was about before, which was, you know, spending eight hours a day in school, constantly interacting with other kids and other adults. Um, and, you know, that all kind of drastically changed. Um, but I think, you know, so, so just kind of acknowledging that this is going to be a tough transition and it's normal to feel scared. It's completely understandable that some of these anxieties have, have developed. Um, but that said, we still need to do it, right? I mean, that's how, like, the only way kind of past is through, you know, in, yes. in terms of this anxiety. So, um, you just have to kind of help your help your kids communicate understanding you know help yeah. them with skills you know kind of coping skills and and support but you know also they have to go back to school and they have to you know they that, that that's part of their duty as they that's right and and the the name school. of this panelist series is raising resilient girls it's not raising girls who kind of get there and you know find, do it sort of you know this this is the resilience and how much resilience must you have at 13 to do your first year of high school virtually at home with your parents? You're resilient, period, okay? <laughs> Might be upset too, but you're also resilient. So there is winning that has already happened. And I think when we tell the children, you're a winner, look at you. You look at how much you've won. High school's already hard. And then we made it like extra hard for you and yeah. you did it, you're a winner. So going to high school, please, you'll be fine. Uh, Dr. Mason, we're going to go to you, and then Dr. Judy has a wonderful activity for everyone. Um, how do you know as a parent that it is time for your child to see professional mental health for anxiety and depression? Mm, that's a really good question because there's a balance between acknowledging that some of it is just typical um, yeah 
development in adolescence and then some of it could be really concerning so there's three key indicators that it's probably time for you to seek um, some consultation with a professional number one is if your child is expressing hopelessness right mm -hmm. if they say things like you know what i'm just over it i can't do this anymore mm -hmm. i i don't want to be part of this world or um, really expressing a lot of what we call passive suicide ideation so really tune into what they're saying if they're expressing hopelessness that's one i would say a big indicator that there's um some risk there number two is if they stopped doing things that they really liked doing before so let's say that you had you have a girl that used to love to play basketball and she was part of the basketball team and then all of a sudden she's like i'm i don't want to do it anymore i'm so over it right so um stopping activities that they really, really used to like uh, before is also another key indicator. And then the last one is, is there a significant change in um, their performance? So were they A and B students and then their grades all of a sudden really shifted? Um, were they the type of girls that really liked being part of family meals and preparing dinner with you and then you know they stopped they started isolating a little bit more I would say these are like the three main things you want to be on the lookout for as an indication of concern excellent really well said thank you Dr. Mesa uh, it is truly my privilege and pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Judy she will be uh, taking over here for a bit and there is a link in the group chat. So if you're watching this live, participate by using the link to minty.com and Dr. Judy, take it away. Thank you, Kyle. So we are going to be doing a little mini workshop right now to give you some tools that will help you with your own productivity and self care and also something that you can teach your children and your teens as well. But before we start that go ahead and click that menti link that was sent at 404 by raising resilient girls in the chat. This is just a quick check in what we want to see is how you're feeling today. We've been talking so much about managing anxiety, stress, depression, and negative feelings, not only for yourself, but of course, for your children. And this is just a really quick poll to assess how you're feeling and a great tool to share with your children and your teens as well as a quick check in that you do with them. This is really great because you're modeling that behavior of being able to self assess. This is a really easy way to self assess. And I always recommend that people utilize this tool once a day, just kind of check in on how they're feeling, what's their mood like, what's their attentiveness. So go ahead and quickly vote. That Menti link is anonymous, and we're going to be able to share those results and see what everybody's temperature is today. But once we get the results, I will share that, but I will go ahead and move on to the workshop as we're waiting for people to start responding on that poll. And one of the things that I love talking about is how we can honor each of our individual strengths. Everybody has their own set of unique strengths and it's fun when we can celebrate them. And also when we are stressed, it's helpful to work with our strengths and not against them. And that's why it's so important for us to learn these self-assessment tools and understand what we can do with them practically to model great behaviors for ourselves as well as our children and teenagers. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and just know that the handout that accompanies this presentation will be available to you um, Raising Resilient Girls, we will be sending out a after webinar uh, email. And in that email, you will have a full PDF of this tool so that you can use it over and over again with your family and your friends. So what we're going to be talking about today is your animal type. Why do I use animals when I talk about personality types? Well, it's because they're easy to identify when we think about animals. We can have this visceral reaction to what these animals represent, what their characteristics are, how we observe them in nature. And this is actually based in a research, very well-researched and robust personality theory called the four temperaments. It's been around for a really long time, and it actually is the father to other tests that you may know about, like the Big Five and the Myers-Briggs. A lot of the principles from the four temperaments have gone on to be uh, a part of the development of these other very popular personality tests. So what I would like you to do is take a look at this slide. 
and tell me which of these is most like you. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through each category and then we're going to read the uh, answers in each column. And you can just kind of have a little tally in front of you. If you have some scratch paper, or you have the notes section on your phone, just open it up and start marking which column represents you best in each of these categories. So for example, the first category is what you tend to like to talk about. Column one says that you might be a person who generally likes to talk about results and achievements. Column two is dreams and aspirations. Column three is feelings and experiences. And column four is facts and figures. And when you're answering these questions, you can think about yourself in a work setting or yourself in a home setting or social setting. It's really up to you. And essentially going through each of these categories row by row and picking which column seems to describe you best and just making a tally of how many answers you have in each column. And that's going to tell you what your dominant personality types are. So I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to work on that. But essentially, we're just going to go through each of these categories line by line, pick the one that seems to describe you best. Sometimes you might think two of the columns sound good, but pick the one that feels most like you should feel pretty intuitive. Don't spend too much time on it. We're going to give you about three to four minutes to finish this assessment. And then we're going to talk about what this all means.
Okay, so maybe another minute to make sure everybody has had a chance to respond and then we're going to talk about what this all means. All right, I hope you've all had a chance to tally up your scores. I know a couple people asked if you have some ties or some close calls. We're going to talk about what all of that means, but just remember where you have your highest level of circles or scores, column one, two, three, or four, and we'll discuss what all of this means now. If most of your circles were in column one, you're a panther. If most of your circles were in column two, you're a peacock. Column three, your dolphin and column four, you're an owl. Now, most people are a combination of the types rather than one pure animal. So you may have the two or three animal types that are kind of dominant for you. And some people also say that they are slightly different at work than they are at home. So their dominant animal type might shift depending on the frame of mind you're answering these questions in. And just so that you can see what the strengths and values are of each of these types. Let's start with the peacock. Again, this would be most answers in column two. Peacocks are ruled by values of fun and adventure. Some of their most admirable qualities are sociable, demonstrative, entertaining, enthusiastic, persuasive, and creative. They tend to be on the extroverted side. That's why you can see this right here, that on this quadrant, these people tend to be more extroverted and outspoken. And also they're on the play side. They're easygoing and more relationship oriented. Moving over to column one, this would be the Panthers. Your strengths and values are control and productivity. Some of your most admirable qualities are that you're purposeful, determined, strong-willed, big thinker, and energetic. You tend to be more ruled on the work side of things. You tend to be organized, decisive, and goal-oriented. And like the Peacock, you're also on the extroverted and outspoken side. Moving down from the panther is the owl. The owls are column four. So you tend to be ruled by values of perfection and security. Now owls, they have a number of admirable traits like tactful, preciseness, orderly, questioning and detail oriented. They tend to be more analytical and reflective as opposed to the peacocks and panthers who tend to be more outspoken. They're more others directed. And dolphins also share this analytical quality. This is if most of your answers are in column three. You're ruled by values of peace and community. And some of your most admirable qualities are rationality, being very caring, insightful, peacemaker, tend to be much more patient and relaxed. And you can see how there's an interplay between all of these traits. As we talked about, most people might not be one pure type. You might be led by two or three dominant types. And when you think about the important people in your life, your partners, your family members, your kids, people that you work with, you can probably see some of these traits emerging. And it obviously sometimes can cause some difficulty in getting along, but a lot of times you you really can come together, understand each other's strengths and learn to work better. So I would love to hear from you what your dominant personality type is. I am sending through another link on Menti. And again, this is an anonymous poll and we're going to talk a little bit about what all of this means. So I want to talk about how we can practically use this assessment. As I mentioned, this is a fun tool to use with your family and your friends and certainly your teenagers and even some of your older kids, they would really enjoy doing something like this and talking to them about the importance of tapping into strengths to be more productive and also to enact better self-care. And there's a lot of different ways you can make your animal type work for you at work. Now, again, you are going to get these handouts, so we're just going to go through them pretty quickly here. But panther archetypes,
types, they have all of these amazing traits as we discussed, but you know, there are some areas in which they can run into some difficulty. They don't like to waste time. They might overlook emotions. So there's a number of work smarter tips where you can really work with your Panther qualities, your strengths, focusing on structured projects, taking time limited breaks, trying to eliminate boredom, involving some kind of challenge throughout your day. Um, try to avoid the tasks that go on and on and lacks purpose. If you are a peacock, you're a natural socialite. We've talked about some of those most admirable qualities, but peacocks are not as good with details compared to the owl, for example, and they don't love strict agendas. So some of the work smarter tips is to try to become a better time manager, try to really work on your procrastination and combine those routine tasks that peacocks don't really love with more dynamic tasks. Peacocks are great at working in intense bursts. So they don't like to do that steady flow. They like to work really hard on a project for a couple hours, then take a break and have some fun. So those are some of the ways that peacocks can really utilize this in work situations. Now dolphins, you have all of these admirable qualities that we've already mentioned, but dolphins don't like to be rushed. So it's important for dolphins to start working in advance to solve one critical problem at a time and to start utilizing the fact that you are really good in groups and teams to actually engage yourself with team-based projects that involve a sense of contribution. Work don'ts for dolphins, again, don't love super scheduled events, don't love a lot of time limitations or too much pressure. Now, if you are an owl, we've talked about some of your most admirable traits already, but owls have a harder time sharing feelings and they don't like change either. And they don't like things that are too casual. So things that can make owls more productive throughout the day, having a methodical and clean workspace so that they can avoid distraction, working things in pieces or smaller tasks, taking advantage of detail orientation and delve deeply into one project at a time that rewards quality over quantity. Owls are also really good at written communication. So anything that can allow them to communicate in a written form, that is going to help them excel at talking about their feelings if that's already something that they have trouble with. Now, all of these types of uh, animal types are actually really important in thinking about self-care. We've already discussed the importance of self-care. We have to take care of ourselves first so we can take care of our families so that we can model coping as Dr. West mentioned and as Dr. Mesa mentioned that if we don't deal with our own parenting anxieties and stresses, it can lead to ineffective parenting inadvertently, not because you're trying to do that, but it's just because things become really overwhelming and hard to manage. So when you take some of these lessons into activities of self-care, hobbies, things that you can teach your children to do, think about self-care if you're a panther that actually brings you a sense of accomplishment. Panthers like things that are more structured, you know, an exercise class that ends at a specific time, something that gives them a unique challenge and involves overcoming maybe a fear. Self-care don'ts are self-care activities that don't have an end time or feels monotonous or repetitive. So it's really interesting when you're trying to design self-care and fun activities for your family to consider everyone's preferences. The peacock self-care Dues for peacocks are group activities that allow for conversation to flow, but peacocks also like a little bit of performance, so they like a little bit of that challenge too. Peacocks do not like self-care tasks with too much rigidity. They also don't like to be alone for too long during their self-care, and so if you can eliminate that or try to eliminate some of the more detail-oriented tasks during self-care activities, that can be re really beneficial for a peacock. Moving on to the dolphins, some of the self-care do's are things that involve a sense of contribution and allows a relaxed time for deeper discussions that are more open-ended. So you can kind of see how dolphins might like different things from panthers. And so there's going to be a little bit of give and take if you have combinations of personality types in your family. Self-care don'ts. Dolphins don't like things that are too brief. They also don't like a ton of novelty or too much multitasking. They kind of like to do one thing slowly at a time, gives them that time to be thoughtful about it and really delve in deeply. And finally, if you're an owl, 
your self-care dues, interestingly, you actually do not mind solitary activities. This is actually kind of fun for you. You enjoy that. And these solitary activities, why they're so beneficial for owls is that it allows you time to contemplate and reflect. It's one of your favorite things that you like to do. And owls love challenges. So when you're learning something new, that's a really beneficial type of self-care as well. Now, self-care don'ts, owls do not like big group activities, particularly big group activities where there's a lot of feelings probing. So if you're thinking about things like, you know, icebreakers where people have to get really personal, that's very uncomfortable for an owl. They would not see that as relaxing. Owls like panthers don't like things that are too unstructured either. So they kind of like an agenda and they like people to follow it. They like to know when they're going to be doing something and what they're going to be doing and how long they're going to be doing it for. Now, in closing, before I show the results of the polls that we took on Menti, I want to encourage you to have fun with this animal types personality test. As Kyle mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, today is about taking care of you, but also in essence, you will be taking care of your family better too. So find creative ways to use this tool at work and play and share this with someone else who might enjoy learning about themselves. And uh, I do have a copy of this handout also on my website, but like I said, you will be receiving an after webinar email with this handout so that you can utilize this over and over again. I'd like to share the results of the polls that we took on Menti, and then I'll hand it back over to Kyle. But earlier, I had asked you guys to uh, contribute to a poll that just kind of checks in on how you're feeling today. And then I also asked you to share your animal types, and I thought that that would be a really fun one for us to look at. So let's go ahead and start with the mood um, assessment that you guys all did. And here you can see that these are the results that you have contributed to today. So here's what we're seeing for today. We see that generally people's mood is kind of in the middle, a little bit on the higher side, 6.4. People's stress levels kind of in the middle. That's really good. And then your attentiveness is also skewing towards, you know, on the higher side, but kind of in the middle of things. So again, this is a really easy and quick assessment tool that you can teach your kids and teens just as a way to check in. You may actually ask them to do this at the dinner table or before they go to bed, just something to help them encourage that self-assessment um, skill that you're going to be building with them. And then let's take a look at the animal type. So I want to show you guys the results of what you guys have. Let's see here. I'm sorry about that. There we go. Um, let me just refresh it to make sure we got everybody's responses in here. Okay, great. So it looks like in our group, we have a lot of dolphins, a lot of dolphins who are natural caretakers. That doesn't surprise me at all. And then we've got peacocks um, as a secondary dominant personality type in our group today, and then owls followed by the panther. So again, really fun to hear these results from you guys. And thank you so much for your attention and participation in this activity. Kyle? Wonderful. And just to make sure uh, you can hear me, is that a yes? Excellent. Uh, Dr. Judy, can uh, young girls take that quiz with their parents? Absolutely. I think that oh. it's an easy quiz to translate to children of all different ages. And because it's quick, it's kind of a fun thing that you can do even at like a family meeting that I discussed yeah. setting up for your family. Excellent. I love the actionable steps you all are providing. Uh, now we are going to go back to our doctors and get more of your questions answered. Dr. Mesa, we will start with you. I love the uh, nomenclature here. Girls are now expected to excel at girl skills and achieve boy goals and be models of female perfection 100% of the time. I know that is the truth. How can parents help their youth build resilience and also protect them against anxiety and depression? Yes. Um, yeah, the expectations for girls um, now more than before and given social media are extremely high. A lot of these pressures are internalized uh, as well from girls. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is the definition of resilience, mm -hmm. right? So resilience means to be able to cope and thrive despite adversity. So we're not saying that as parents, you're going to be able to make their their life easy and everything's going to be perfect because that's just unrealistic, right? 
there has to be some struggles in there. And what really builds resilience is their ability to thrive and cope despite these things. Yeah. So one thing that parents can do to really support build resilience is to help their teens build a toolbox of coping strategies and coping strategies that work for them. Right. So for some teens, a really helpful coping strategy might be to distract from academic activities and to be in non academic activities for other girls coping might look like planning ahead and working with their parents and planning ahead activities. So it's going to be really important to work together with your teen on building their toolbox of, of coping uh, strategies. Excellent answer. And on the topic of tools, Dr. West, what type of actionable tools can parents put in their in their toolbox today? Anything that comes to mind? To help with anxiety and stress in particular, oh, or depression or all of the above? Yes. And and <laughs> and also to uh, you know, I'm I'm not a parent, full disclosure, but I certainly can see the difference in existing in this world as a girl or as a boy it is it is just different i have i even as a child i remember thinking wow we really cater to a specific type of person in this world and it's not always little girls so uh, that as well a parent navigating that on top of all of that what tools do you have sure sure yep so a couple of things i mean in terms of the the kind of impossible expectations and, and battling those impossible expectations again i think just being explicit and communicating about about the unrealistic nature of those kinds of expectations is really important. Like they are out there, right? And and you can't stop your girls from being exposed to, to all, you know, of these crazy expectations and standards that they're held to. So I think just having open conversations about, you know, social media might make you feel this way you know, comparing yourself to, to others might make you feel this way. Like here are the dangers there. Here are what happens when, you know, we do that, which, which we do as humans. Um, and, you know, here's what you need to remember. And then again, you know, just communicating that at the end of the day, like nobody is perfect. Everybody is vulnerable. Everybody has challenges. Everybody needs to embrace their vulnerability. So, you know, it, kind of helping them understand that they're going to have to balance, you know, living in this world where there's, you know, really high expectations and high standards that they're going to come across and, and, and somehow, you know, through kind of coping strategies, tools, and just like embracing, you know, vulnerability that they're going to kind of be able to achieve that, that balance. Um, so, so that's with regard to that kind of expectations piece. Um, in terms of just managing the stress and anxiety and, and kind of, you know, mood issues that, that go along with that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of different tools that, that parents can, can use. I mean, you know, some of it is just kind of coaching and supporting your kids to, to find what works for them in terms of, you know, what sorts of relaxation strategies work for them, what sorts of pleasurable activities work for them, what sorts of ways to move their body and get exercise work for them. We kind of, you know, we, we know the basics about what's important. Um, and then, you know, a lot of it's just helping your child to kind of figure out the particular um, tailored ways of doing those things that work for them. But I, I do think there are some things more at kind of the, the systems or the structural level that parents can do. Um, one is that kids, you know, young kids, we think of it more in terms of younger kids, but I think it's true for adolescents to thrive with structure and organization. So, and this is, you know, I honestly think part of the reason why stress has risen up so high in, in light of the pandemic is because routines and structure oh, it has to out be. the window. It yeah. has to be. I never had anxiety in my whole life. And then COVID hit and three months in, I go, what is this feeling? And then mm -hmm. like, anxiety. Yeah. 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 I, humans are not meant, you know, we're, we're meant to kind of, you know, live in a routinized um, and, and, you know, yeah, kind of ritualized fashion. And so I think, you know, imposing some sort of daily predictable routine in, into and, and schedule and, you know, not that it has to be rigid and can't change ever, right. but right. there needs to be some, you know, 
boundaries and some structure to daily life. You know, meals happen at these times and in this way. You know, yeah. devices happen at these times and in this way. Homework happens here. Breakfast, you know, school transition happens here. Just, yeah. there, you know, needs to be some structure there. I often coach parents to incorporate into the routines two kinds of activities um, that I really think can help regulate mood. Um, one is uh, what I call um, release activities. Um, so activities that are really meant to like get rid of some of, well, for kids who are like hyperactive or, or um, you know, tend towards um, high activity levels, getting rid of some of that, that excess energy, you know, moving, moving bodies, kind of releasing energy. It can also be good for kids on the other end of the spectrum who are really hypoactive, who, you know, are kind of sitting in their bed all day, not coming out of their room, getting them moving, I think can be a really positive thing. Yeah. Um, so those kind of, you know, activity based release activities and then um, soothing activities. So something that's designed to like to stabilize the nervous system at some point in the day. And again, that can be different things for different kids. It could be listening to, to you know, nice music, um, you know, soft, relaxing music. It could be taking a walk. It could be doing deep breathing or yoga, or, you know, I mean, um, but I think proactively incorporating both a release activity and a soothing activity into the daily routine, not just as a reactive coping strategy, but actually as a proactive mm. um, strategy to regulate mood, it can be really helpful. I, I love the idea of being proactive with that. Um, I, I remember interviewing a psychiatrist about depression and for the first time she said, well, I really like to try to prevent depression and focus on happiness. And I thought, man, in all of these interviews, we always talk about I'm depressed, what to do? I'm depressed, what to do? My daughter's depressed, what do I do? Well, how about if everyone's not depressed, let's keep it that way. And you just gave a laundry list of things to do. I also wanna take just a moment to talk about, you mentioned mindfulness very quickly, but I, I think mindfulness in social media is can be a game changer and at least for me and i'm basically a 35 year old teenager but on my <laughs> social media i realized that every time i closed down instagram my mood was low i felt worse about my life and myself but i only realized that because i was really being mindful and really paying attention to that interaction and ironically the next feeling i had was well i need to get rid of this feeling so what do i turn to social media again to try to find that feeling and it wasn't until I go I am in a trap I have I, I'm trapped by this and um I don't need to talk about me anymore but that mindfulness component for ourselves to model that behavior and ask our our, our children why do you look at this person mm -hmm. like what are your reasons you know I'm, I'm just curious to know because I, I can't imagine that most kids are getting off social media feeling like they are good and have it all you know, it's just not the way it's designed. Yeah. Um, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and that's what the research shows. And that's kind of why I, um, you know, brought up um, in what I said before about kind of being explicit about social comparison. I mean, that's what social media is about, right? Yeah. That's, that's what we do is we socially compare ourselves to others. Yep. And that always makes us feel worse. We think always. that it makes us feel better. It always makes us feel worse. Always. And by the way, I have a Zoom filter on right now. So if you <laughs> thought that my skin looks this good, it don't, okay? I am on sleep and a prayer right now and a Zoom filter. So Dr. Meza, a lot of parents struggle themselves with depression. This parent is saying, is asking, how do I help my daughter with her emotions when I myself suffer from anxiety and depression? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I think has been mentioned um, throughout this conversation is to be really open about that, right? And normalizing it um, mm -hmm. and not stigmatizing that language, right? Because let, let, let me interrupt you real quick. How do I normalize depression to my five-year-old? talking about it and talking okay. how how sometimes you know mommy feels sad because you know I had a really hard day at work and I'm really overwhelmed with you know how much I have to do and that's okay to feel sad is completely okay I but I just hear all these parents right now going my daughter is stressed out she is stressed out because she sees what's going on I'm not going to come home and tell her 
that I am also stressed out and depressed because I'm the one thing she's relying on. What's the response? Exactly. And it's not just normalizing and saying, you know, I feel sad too. What's really important is the second step. What Mm. can we do to make it better? How Mm. can we get out of this? How can we, like you said, build resilience? Let's think together on strategies that will get us out of this space. Right. So it's not just normalizing and talking about it, but also probably problem solving together um, as a way to to get out of this. Wonderful. I I love that. Um, Is there anything else you can say on that? I interrupted you. I should just let you talk. (laughs) No, I I mean, um, as an ADHD uh, clinician, I've been noticing that there's a lot of questions about ADHD and Dr. Amy West was giving such good um, tips on how to help with mood and distraction since they go together. So depression increases distractibility. So one thing that um, has really helped teens manage not just their mood, but also concentrate a little bit better during their Zoom classes is to be in front of natural light, which is actually a type of treatment for depression to be in in front of like vitamin D and to have natural sunlight. So if you can have your teen have their computer and where they get natural sunlight into uh, their space, not only will that improve their mood, but that also increases their um, concentration levels. If that's not possible because they're, you know, they're doing their work in their room, you can also purchase a light that you can attach to their computer that has like, uh, you know, natural sunlight, um, you know, lights. And it's really helpful. A lot of parents have really said that that strategy has really helped. And I use it myself too. Nice. Well, yeah, your house looks very well. <laughs> um, now, how does all this uncertainty play into the stress uh, right now for girls, especially when they don't have the ability to know if they'll go back to school in three, six, or 12 months? Yeah. Um, one of the characteristics of anxiety is that you tend to f- focus and worry about the future, whereas mm-hmm. for depression, you worry about the past. <laughs> wow, that is interesting. That now is imagine, really interesting. Now imagine having both anxiety and depression. You're bo- you're thinking about things that you've done in the past, but you're yeah. also worried about the future. Yeah, well, That's I don't not- have to imagine, but yeah, I get it. Um, <laughs> I do that all the time. Um, that is really interesting, um, man. We don't have time to go into more of that detail, but that was really good. So, okay, keep going. So one one of the, the things that um, a lot of girls or parents are thinking about is like, what are we going to do if we don't know what to expect? We don't know what's going to come in six months. And one thing that we really encourage parents and teens to do is to just kind of sit with that distress um, and uh, be able to tolerate the uncertainty. So how can you acknowledge that and at the same time, let it go? Mm-hmm. Right. And and acknowledge that you can't plan everything for the future. And one thing that you can do is like we can focus on today. We can focus on this week. So what can we do this week since we really don't know what's going to happen in the past um, and in the future? I mean, yeah. So, yeah. The, yeah. The, and that that makes sense. I mean, if mindfulness is really being in the present moment and depression is harboring the past and anxiety is worrying about the future, then it makes sense that the solution would be mindfulness in the present moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really, and, really beautiful. and if the teen has a really hard time, like not being able to think about um, the future, one thing that you can do is schedule worry time and not have it be more than 30 minutes. Oh, wow. So you're going to say, okay, I know you're really thinking about the next six months. Let's set aside 30 minutes, you know, on whatever day. And during those 30 minutes, we're going to worry about the future and that's okay. But after those 30 minutes, we're we're not. We're going to think about the present and, and focus on the things that we do have control over. And that way you're kind of balancing both, right? I schedule worry time. Like I have my agenda. I don't know if people can see it. I schedule worry time because if I'm just completely neglecting it, like it's just going to keep on coming back. Where do you like to worry? Where? Yeah. Where I don't uh, have my workspace. It has to be separate from my workspace. So it has to be in a neutral, what I call neutral zone. <laughs> Wow, worry time. Man, I'm learning so much. This is so good. 
Um, okay, let's go to another question. Uh, I would love to hear some mindfulness ideas that help us practice without it feeling like a mindfulness technique. Uh, sometimes when I've tried to incorporate the classic tools with my daughter, I don't have a daughter, I'm reading someone's question. She isn't in a place uh, to follow, but I know there are sneaky and fun ways to bring mindfulness into the conversation. Dr. Judy, you and I have talked about this a few times. Do you have any sneaky, clever ways to get our young children into the mindfulness state? Oh, absolutely. I think that sometimes people think about mindfulness and they're still thinking about, you know, it's almost like a meditation where you have to mm -hmm. sit cross-legged and you have to like, you know, breathe and close your eyes and recite mantras. And that's just not true. We have so many different fun ways to do mindfulness and mindfulness can be just as simple as doing a routine without distractions. And so one of my favorite mindfulness activities that I like to model for younger people is, you know, just making coffee or making tea or making a drink, but just having this real attentiveness to that particular ritual of everything, you know, taking the cups out, you know, having fun with it, choosing the coffee pod, right? And so obviously with teens, you may not use coffee, but you may use something else. You may use preparing food. You may use cooking as a type of mindfulness activity. Also, what I love is moving mindfulness. So taking a walk around the neighborhood and really just observing and taking things in around you. I remember I um, used to hike so much Every single day I would go on the Temescal Canyon hike, which is in the kind of Malibu, Santa Monica, Malibu mountains area. And I was never mindful about it. I'd be like on my phone hiking, um, talking to my friends who I was hiking with. And once I started to incorporate mindful hiking, it was so crazy. I remember one day I was going up this path that had gone up 200 times and I saw this big tree and it was the first time I'd ever seen that tree, even though I'd been there the entire time, right? And so just even modeling that with your children, going on a mindful walk, a mindful hike, doing something that's a moving mindfulness activity, that's a great and sneaky way to put mindfulness back in the picture, especially for younger people. And also another way to incorporate mindfulness is to really just demonstrate mindful eating. Um, I think a lot of times we're always distracted when we're eating. Again, you might be on your phone, you might be watching TV, but really making sure to protect that time and really enjoying your food, like understanding the sensory experience of it, chewing slowly. And one of the easiest ways to practice that is to just eat like one small, really decadent piece of food but eating it so slowly and taking your time to like smell the food, you know, taste it, talk about the sensations. And you can do this with a little piece of chocolate or, you know, a favorite dessert of your daughter or son. And that's another fun way to incorporate that in for your children. Really, really great. And, and the mindfulness of the tree is so impactful. And it's not because you just saw a new beautiful tree. That's great. It is evidence that you're doing it. It's evidence that you're connecting back with yourself. And you can take that little element of peace with you into your day. Um, if you can be mindful on a hike, you can be mindful, you know, in your car and other places as well. It was excellent. Uh, Dr. Mesa, I've so enjoyed hearing from you. And now we get to hear less of me and way more from you. Dr. Mesa is going to lead us through an activity. The floor is yours. Wonderful. Um, so I know that we have been discussing a lot of um, things that are concerning to us as parents. Um, and one thing that I always encourage parents to do is to balance, you know, uh, negatives with positives. Um, and there's actually a rule of thumb for every one negative thing that you notice in your teen, you should balance that with four positive things that um, you notice in your teen. And developmentally during teenage years, teens tend to have a bias to noticing the negative things in themselves. And one thing that we can really do to help them build resilience is to help them notice the positive. So now what I want everyone to do is to get in that mindset of, what are some positive things that you notice in your teen? And I want everyone or every parent to write down at least three positive things or three strengths that you notice in your teen. And if possible, really push yourself to have them be, uh, you know, non-achievement positive things. So for example, um, you can write, my kid is very smart or they get really good grades, but I'm really going to push you to think about what are some other qualities that is a strength in your teen 
Are they really caring about the environment? Um, um, are they really funny and silly and make people laugh? So I'm going to give everyone about a minute or two to write them down. If you don't have a piece of paper, and it's really important that you write them down, share them with us on the chat. We want to hear what parents are thinking in terms of strengths for their for their teens. Um, and I'll give everyone two minutes and then we'll come back. So remember, three strengths that you notice in your teens, have them be a balance of both achievement and, and qualities um, uh, of their personality. Um, and, it, and again, yes, it's not just your, your teen, your child, whatever age they're in. I see some coming in. And be as specific as possible, right? All right, I see some coming in that they uh, love to sing, they love to move, they're funny, they're strong. All right, keep them coming and write them down because you will have a small homework assignment to do with these strengths at the end. Oh, I'm loving all of these. Like, I don't know if you, if you can all see, have a big smile on my face. Just reading this is um, already improving my mood. <laughs> can make friends easily. That's a great strength to have. Mm -hmm. All right, so 30 more seconds to write down strengths that you notice in your child or your teen. <laughs> I'm noticing that some of these are just shared with the panelists. Uh, remember, if you're on chat, if you can share with panelists and attendees so that everyone can see all of these incredible strengths. There's a lot of overlap I'm noticing with, uh, <laughs> with the strengths that people are noticing. I love that somebody put here, my kid will do anything to, to put a smile on other people's faces. And they're very silly, adventurous. All right, 10 more seconds. All right, um, this is wonderful. I can really tell that this was this was easy for parents to come up with so many strengths in their uh, children and, and teens. Um, and the reason why I had everybody think about strengths is because it can really shift the way that you think about your own parenting and the way that you interact with your teen or with your child. So what we're going to have you do once you go home is don't keep these strengths to yourself. Share them with your teen and, and, and child. Let them know that you um, notice that they have a lot of strengths, right? So we want to balance 
the negative messages that they're hearing from social media, from school with positive ones, positive ones that can build their self-esteem, that can build their sense of accomplishment. So for homework, what I want everyone to do is for the three strengths that you picked out for your kids, I want you to share them in a genuine way whenever possible with your team. So this technique, we call it catching your child being good. So for those of you that shared, you know, my kid is really funny. They'll do anything to put a smile on other people's faces. Look for opportunities where you can notice that and say it out loud to them. So for example, if, you know, they say a really funny joke on the way to, you know, to dinner, or if they just, you know, say something really funny, catch them being good and say, you know what, that was really funny. I really love the way that you make our family laugh. And you will see, uh, hopefully you can um, either record it or really attune to their face. You will see how their, their face lights up when you catch them being good or notice something good. And see if you can do this throughout the entire week um, and hopefully moving forward. But it, the point is to get in the habit of, of pointing out positive things, not just the negative things. One way that you can do it other than, you know, just saying to saying it to them verbally is to have post-it notes so that you can write thank you notes to your kids, um, you know, for something good that they did. So if they took out the trash, you can do a little note saying, you know, thank you so much for, you know, helping me take out the trash today um, or things like that. So thank you everyone for really sharing with me and the group all the strengths that you notice in your teen and your child and and just know that catching them being good and uh sharing with them the things that you notice in them that are that is positive really goes a long way it helps them build uh resilience it helps them build their own self-esteem so i really encourage you all to share the strengths with your kiddos Oh, really uh, great. I'm very blurry right now, and I don't know why. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to be blurry for a little bit, uh, but that's okay. Nobody needs to see me. Um, Dr. Meza, wonderful um, uh, example on how to focus on that positive aspect every chance we get. It's easy to call out the bad, undesirable behavior. It takes mindfulness to call out the good behavior, the ones that we like. Today has been really impactful for me, even as an uncle. So I hope that as parents and caregivers, you have found a similar value. In addition to uh, all of our viewers, I'm gonna ask the panelists the same question. Um, you guys will share uh, on camera, but I want to uh, hear from people live. What is one thing that you will do this week that you learned here today. Awareness is great. Conversations are wonderful. Discussions are beautiful. But if that's it, then what is the point? Action is where it's at. And we know Girl Scouts is an entire organization based on action. So certainly the parents must have action. Um, Dr. Meza, we'll start with you. What is one thing that you heard or learned today that inspired you and is motivating you to act? Yeah, I think uh, practice what I preach, right? I, I think as psychologists, we tend to share a lot of tips and sometimes we forget to do them ourselves. So one thing that I really hope to take with me is to you know, compliment my partner and notice all of the positive things this week. Excellent. And uh, Dr. Judy, she's no shortage of takeaways. What have you learned today? Well, there were so many great practical tips and I think that hopefully everybody here has found all of these different things helpful. And I would say that it's just important to try one tip a day. I know that it can be so easy to feel overwhelmed. There's a lot of things that we talked about, but if you've been taking some notes and of course we will have this recording available, just commit to trying one of the tips that we talked about 
today. And I would say that a really easy one, again, to bring awareness that we didn't get to mention is next time you're not feeling great or you do something that you don't like, just ask yourself this one simple question. What was I thinking just mm. before that? It really gets you understanding that relationship between your thoughts and your feelings and your behaviors. And the more awareness you have about what causes your negative feelings and behaviors that you don't like so much, and same thing with your children, the more you're going to be able to feel more control over it and apply the proper or most helpful coping strategy. Beautifully said. And Dr. West, what about yourself? So I am going to go home and try to catch both of my kids doing things that are positive today right. and make sure yeah. that I communicate that to them. Yeah. Um, and I'm also going to try to be very conscious about modeling vulnerability and struggle this week and kind of narrating that for my, for my children. It was uh, so wonderful to hear all three of you provide such actionable insight and uh, education and knowledge. And you also were so great interacting in the chat live. Uh, it's one of the big perks for joining these panelists live is that type of access and interaction. Um, don't forget, everyone, you will be receiving an email tomorrow with this recording, the conversations and resources that were covered today. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And uh, if you don't see it, check your spam folder. I certainly want to say super big thank you to Girl Scouts of Greater Los Angeles, our panelists, Dr. Amy West, Dr. Jocelyn Mesa, and Dr. Judy Ho. Last but not least, we would like to thank our main sponsor for this event. Look at that, MedCircle. That's where I work. <laughs> uh, MedCircle is a mental health education platform. Uh, if you would like to get educated on mental health topics, you can use MedCircle. Thank you to all the other gold and silver sponsors for your help. And we look forward to, con and Pearl sponsors, look at that. All of the support and community coming out to show for Girl Scouts of America. Our next panel is Wednesday, May 19th at 3.30 p.m. That is Pacific time. And we'll be talking about transitioning back to school and mitigating some of the learning loss that can happen. I want to say thank you for all of you, the parents, the caregivers for doing this. It is what is it? it is Wednesday in the middle of the day and evening for some of us. It is tiring. We are in May. Things are nuts. And you made the commitment to yourself, to your family to do this. And that deserves a round of applause. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so wonderful. Uh, we'll see you on the next one on May 19th. And remember, whatever you're going through, you got this. <laughs>